Ask not what Almighty God can do for you. Ask God what you can do for your country. Now the trumpet summons us again, where the strong are summoned to give service, summoned to bear arms. All this will be finished, the final success of Syria, asking his blessing, and let us never fear the command to undo the heavy burden and let the oppressed go free. Let us begin. Hi there, Monday, October 30th, 2023. This video is from the archive, January of this year. It's a Bible study that I don't think saw the light of day online. So I went ahead, I edited it, I'm breaking it down to two parts. The first part is us just hashing out a couple questions, and then the second part is the actual meat of the Bible study. But the first part's interesting, the first part that you're going to see right now. It's where we tackle a few things regarding celebrity, idol worship, and witchcraft, uh, just for a brief moment, and then we get into how do you know if you're saved? It's kind of a big ticket question item that a lot of people are asking because people have some wily, weird answers. So we try and attempt to answer that, but I hope you're blessed and edified. There's going to be some more videos that we bring out, and I'm not going to do too much to edit them, just kind of like put them together and send out. This one was almost three hours long, so I'm going to break it up into two parts. If you have any thoughts, questions, suggestions, please post up comments, then forward get people to like, subscribe. Whatever's happening overseas, don't pay any attention. Pay attention to what God has you doing right here, right now. Be aware of everything, the times, the signs, the celestial events, everything, but don't focus on more than what God wants you to focus on. Put your faith in him. Keep your eyes on him. I hope you enjoy. God bless. Godspeed. See ya. It's probably the most spiritually active I think I've entered a year. Yeah? To say the least. Really? Uh, yeah, so two years ago, we were actually walking around D.C. during New Year's Eve. And I had already been walking around D.C. probably like 20 times that year. And I felt nothing. There was no spiritual agitation. There was no like, you know, almost like something that would kind of get you like prophetically wound up or something. Nothing. And so all of a sudden, I, I go into this year, I'm like, this is like a bombardment. At least like I feel that people that are on mission, that are over their target and they're actually in the fight, I think they're totally engaged. You know, you can have life that's going on, everything's going good, but the spiritual component outside of that, the physical stuff that the enemy tries to attack, it's pretty heavy. And so everyone else I know that's over the target on their mission, they're calling whatever God's calling them to, like they're getting hit left and right. Yeah, my girlfriend was just watching a video. This girl was talking about how celebrities and whatnot that are you know higher up, when they do certain things like the devil horns and sticking their tongue out and all these, all this symbolism that they're doing in their music videos and just out in public, it actually it does mean something. And they get us to worship their gods without even knowing it. And it, it just kind of blows my mind because it's like, wow, okay, well, can you worship somebody without knowing it? It's like, absolutely, you can. You're, it's your actions and, and how you live and what you do. So that just provides a totally new perspective. I mean, I always knew it, but it's just something I haven't necessarily paid as much attention to in the last few months. So, so it's just no, interesting to hear that perspective again. I totally get that. Um, and you'll appreciate this, right? The Lord inhabits the praise of his people. What do you think happens when there's, you know, a 50,000 person concert venue that's packed for Beyonce, Jay-Z, like whoever. You've got corporate worship and their mm -hmm. God inhabits the praise of his people. I used to go to Slayer and Metallica concerts, you know, mm -hmm. suicidal tendencies. I'd go to all these bands and I didn't identify it, but it was like the spirit of anger, rage, murder, like everything. It was all there. And when you realize that, hindsight, there's a spiritual authority that is given when you worship, especially if like you surround yourself in that sphere. And in doing that, it's interesting because what are we giving away that we can never get back? Our time. Mm -hmm. So if we give something our time, it becomes an altar. We actually sacrifice our time on that altar. Yeah. And all of a sudden you realize, okay, so that's time that we can't get back. Who is that a rap artist that had people die in Texas? Oh, uh, Travis Scott. Yeah. It's just that, a thing. That was bad. <laughs> and if, if you look at what he's doing, right? Like they're, they're trying to do levitation. They're trying to incorporate whatever their, their shtick is. However much of it's real or spiritual, we have no clue. It was obviously spiritual. Like you had people who aren't even active Christians or even any sort of active religion. It was definitely evil. And uh, the symbolism that he had with a cross going into the mouth and or into the fire, there was a lot of symbolism surrounding that show for sure. I think it's exciting. I mean, honestly, think about how many years we did church where the supernatural wasn't even talked about, where the other side wasn't talked about. Yeah. And it's like, oh, we're just, you know, we're happy. We're great. Everyone's good. Everyone's, you know, 
on solid footing and all of a sudden what's God saying? Like, that's not the full picture. And it's not that people need to be bombarded with it, but at least to have like a balanced perspective of it. And so now I feel like God's correcting that and he's given us a different lens. And like Paul Cap, like what started you down your path on the whole eschatology thing? Just, it's like ho Holy Spirit thing or was it just something it inside was, of you? It was just as I studied scripture, I didn't see anywhere in scripture where the pre-tribulational rapture position was taught. I mean, every pastor adhered to it in the evangelical church at large. And when I started to question them on where where they got these ideas from, they always would refer to some book other than the Bible. And so I started going to the bookstores, finding those books, and started comparing what those books were against the Bible. And I just realized these, these are basically just people pulling ideas out of thin air and they don't even know where the idea came from because all their books had no bibliography, had no backup, no, you know, uh, technical references. So I realized nobody knew what they were talking about. So I started, you know, sneaking into the Calvary Chapel's pastors conferences every year. And I would, you know, camp out in the eschatology classes. And um, I wanted to see what the Calvary Chapel church movement who who they lifted up as their eschatology expert and hmm. i was horrified when i sat in those classes because clearly their expert was clueless he had he he was talking all over himself and he was you know going in from one position to another he didn't even understand the position which they claimed to be in so that's when i just started like a you know a 30 year long process of studying eschatology to basically get it nailed down and even now, the eschatology classes that I attend, it's almost like the teachers are on crack because they're all over the place. And they have no idea what they're teaching. They're just parroting stuff that somebody else has written. And their summations, you think, are from another planet because they, what they surmise at the end of the class have absolutely nothing to do with what they just got done teaching for six months. And, and so what I realized is none of them have a clue as to what they're teaching they, they don't have it they don't have it in their own minds they don't understand it in their own minds and all they're doing is just parroting stuff that people have told them to look at and so i realized there was just a huge vacancy in this area that needed needed a little work and and once you rolled up your sleeves and started looking at it, you realize why no pastors were doing it because it you, you really have to know your bible end to end in well, order to pull it together isn't it also that like now as things are being revealed, right? Because more prophecy is unfolding every day. Like the Holy Spirit's revealing and showing things and getting more people, right? That Daniel 7 cogitation of the heart. There's a there's a thing when you even start to process what's happening around you. It's like a weird, like mm, something's off, something's off. That that didn't exist 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You know, growing up in the church, like and, and all those guys, if, if they didn't have their story straight, there's a lot of, you know, academic Christians that don't even have full faith. Like they don't even believe God. They believe in God and they believe, you know, like his word, you know, there's a historical reference, but I think a lot of them actually don't even fully, um, <clears throat> fully subscribe to everything. So I think you're being too nice. I, I, I would go as far as to say there's a lot of Manchurian candidates in the church. Totally. That, that have purposely planted themselves to deceive and mislead. It's not that they're unaware and stupid or ignorant. They are there to actively deceive and mislead. Oh, yeah. I, it, people don't want to believe that's true. That's it. They don't mm -hmm. want to believe it. They, they actually want to believe they're nice and everyone else is generally nice, even though the Bible says the heart's, heart's desperately wicked. And so because of that, it's like they, they're almost comfortably numb and they're comfortably there it's that self-deception in which i still feel matthew 24 and the first thing that jesus said be beware that you're not deceived i think it's actually self-deception and well, well the bible also says these types of people go to bed conspiring to do evil and they wake up in the morning to execute it right so if you believe your bible you have to believe that people are capable of evil at a level that normally as innocent christians like jesus said in luke that we're supposed to be as wise as serpents, but innocent as doves, right? The, the problem is we've forgotten the wise as serpents part, <laughs> and, and we're not in touch with 
how evil evil can be. I had I've had to find out over the years exactly how dark that is. And like, you know, finding the occult books when I'm 10, right? What what few things I was just pissed off at God that no one told me there was another side. Right? Like, especially in kids' church. And that's why I still feel the the hardest dude at church needs to be the youth pastor. Has to be. Like for for what our kids are walking into at scale, if our kids aren't yeah. like equipped, like, and I'm talking about like physically, I'm talking physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, like like the youth pastors need to be just a league, in, like unto themselves. I, I but I know like there's 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 the God fearing alpha, servant hearted alpha. You know, there's a lot of us. It's just a matter of like, what are we actually doing? Are we encouraging others to be that? It's not like we have this feather in our cap and we walk around saying like, you got to be like me. It's it's with a lot of humility and contrition. We're trying to say mm-hmm. like, you know, we, you might want to do this a different way. And that's just, that's running our race full speed without compromise. And if we do that, I feel like, especially in the church, right, the reason why there are, you know, there are no real men at church is because most men aren't there. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, I, I feel, man, if, if if the men would just go to church just to engage the atmosphere, I think that you would actually find some kinetic change. And that, that's what I'm hoping, like, when we record these things, we I, I might go live at some point. I don't know. They'll get consensus. But the it's idea is that. live on mine. I think it's it's just recording. I mean, do we want to go live to YouTube in that noise? You'll get censored. You'll, you'll, you'll get, yeah, you'll get. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, bro, that it, more COVID, and that'll be the end of it. Well, uh, yeah. one one thing that I was uh, going to point out about what you said there is, uh, we have to have you know some humility in you know introducing people to the word and whatnot. And I think that's the biggest problem most people have is they they approach people with this self righteous self righteousness and uh, um, this smug attitude. That is just like, oh, you're bad. No, it, it needs to be, hey, look, we're we're all bad. Like I'm bad too. And you know, here, try try this, you know. Uh rather than, you know, because people people don't they don't open up to that. Like I, I wish people, I wish, I wish people who were actually passionate about the faith would would get that and say, hey, look, we have to be smart about how we approach people, uh, non-believers, because they won't listen to you if you are talking like you're talking down to them. Well, I, I think a lot of like that, those self-righteous types, I think they're out there clubbing baby seals. I think that's kind of like what it, what it seems like when that's why I feel if you're running a race, you're doing it with conviction and like, dude, even the stuff that like you say when you're, when you're making posts and you're sprinkling in these things, right. Being unapologetic about your faith and your position that's there's a genuine nature of a human being that has contrition that has humility but also is walking in authority and awareness of who they are within you know like who's who in the zoo i I think there's an appeal to that because what it's blurring is we're all spiritual beings we all totally have a sense that we're going somewhere something's happening it's it's going kinetic at some point and so because of that like what are we what are we doing with it and and men don't even know that a lot of men don't know that you can walk that out in on full display without trepidation, without fear, without hesitation, They're like, yeah. And, and so it's not like even trying to, you know, evangelize. I personally still feel like the season of evangelizing, it's going to take on different form and shape. Like I think more supernatural things are going to start happening as the Holy spirit unfolds and people will say like, uh, what is that? I want that. Whatever, whatever that thing is. <clears throat> I, I think that's going to set the stage for conversation because as much as we need to be evangelizing, we need to be casting out devils. And Nehemiah mm-hmm. four, Nehemiah four actually, it gives us a behavioral profile. All right. So, what are you on here, John? Are you on here, Martindale? Yeah, you're there. Um, like you'll appreciate this, right? Like the law enforcement side. Kevin might join on if he's done at the gym. But basically, what are you? What are you walking around? We've talked about this before. Society is affected by attitude and emotions at a scale that's never happened before. You know, it's it's like, and what do you realize? Demon influence, right? Little whispers in your ear agitate you. What do they influence? Attitude and emotions. You can't even keep that in check. And when you, when we read Nehemiah four and other parts of the Bible, 
it starts to outline when demonic influence and in someone that's aggressing someone of faith or a group of people of faith, it flares up their attitude, emotions, anger, fury, jealousy. Uh, you know, it's just this something inside them. They have no clue what they're being puppeted by. And we're, we're going to get, you know, further down the rabbit hole and really talk about like, listen, the Lord knows those that are his, which clearly means there are those that aren't which means we need to be cognizant of both and pray accordingly. And we're praying to God, if those people are yours, right? Send your worst, but still send savior, you know, salvation, faith, forgiveness. But Father, if they're not yours, send distress, confusion, frustration, angst, destruction, like throw the kitchen sink at them as often as possible. And then what does God do? God trusts us with that spiritual warfare engagement, those, that violent prayer. For a lot of people, they don't even think that there's something to pray against at that measure. And so for those of us to understand what's happening as things are you know, going kinetic around us, as we're you know, doing this first in prayer and then in person, we're giving God everything. Like there's nothing left unsaid. And I think that's kind of like the point of at least what I try to get across. I don't know. You, know, you never yeah. know what that reach is. Hey, if, uh, if you don't have like a, uh, like a schedule of things that you're wanting to talk about, um, are you, do you have one? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We're, we're jumping into it's Nehemiah four, um, Deuteronomy twenty, and, and Psalm eighty nine. We kind of run long, dude. By the way, like by all means, if you got to jump off, like you're a busy man, so don't even worry about it. Yeah, we don't take I, it personal. Well, I was uh, I was going to ask because one thing that has been kind of an area of confusion for me is what does it actually take to become saved? Because I have, you know, I, the last the last like small group that I was a part of, they were very, uh, how should I say? It was like, it was like harsh. And it's not that I don't appreciate some, some harshness every now and then. Uh, but it was like, um, oh yeah, if, if you're doing this thing, you're not saved, but it's like, okay, well then what, what does it mean to be saved? Cause, cause it's, if it's not works and if it's not obeying the law, and it's supposed to be a gift. How does that, you know, I, I just, it, it was confusing. And so I, you know, I had some uh, issues sitting there and listening to the things that he was talking about. Cause it's like, I, I think you're missing the, the, the picture. I think you're picking out, you know, certain aspects of scripture and, and molding it into this, but, but you're ignoring certain other aspects. And I, I don't know, I think maybe both sides do that a little bit. I don't know. But I was going to ask you what your thoughts were on that. I'm, I mean, you'll hear me say phrases, right? Like, thank God, like he does God things and I do Steve things. Um, like when it comes to salvation, I don't think salvation is a one and done. I think it's an ongoing process. I think that's why it's the helmet of salvation. It's not the helmet of the saved. I think there's, there's, there's an ongoing process, including backsliding, repenting, right? All those things. I, I do believe that we receive salvation. We cannot earn it in, a, in countless second tries. I believe that the mark of the Holy Spirit on your life will compel you to do works because you are so, we, we, you feel the weight of glory, the indebtedness that we have of, of being given salvation that we will never be able to earn. And so it compels us with great conviction, in, internal conviction. And it's sometimes difficult to process, but compels us to do things, to say things, to to give to the poor, right? Isaiah 58 and 59, right? The perfect fast that he's chosen. It wasn't just going without food. It's breaking the bonds, uh, you know, letting the oppressed go free, it, it, giving to the poor. It enumerates all these things. I So I would never lie to myself and say, I'm saved. I always look at myself like I'm in the process of being saved. I'm in the process of contending with God. It's almost like I've got several postures operating concurrently. I don't doubt my salvation because I don't doubt God and his love for me. But at the same time, I know God has given us the gift of work, the gift of speech, um, of actually hashing these things out at a small and big ticket level. And the whole point is, don't stop hashing things out. I'll never arrive at a place of salvation that'll put me in cruise control or neutral. It's always forward. And I don't believe that my faith can ever stand still. I think it's always a perpetual forward movement. I don't believe that every single person is called to transcendent amazing book of acts faith i look at the whole body of christ and 
I believe that we all have a position and a role to play, right? There's a loving hands and feet of Christ. There's a sword of the Lord. And there's everyone in between. And historically, look at militancy in the Bible. Look at Gideon, 32,000 soldiers down to 300. It's 1%. What about the nation's history? George Washington, 1.5% of all the fighting age males that could have fought in, in the revolution did. And so we have a precedence that the 1% is the people that we're looking to that will actually engage these principles on like a fully balanced, full spectrum. This is our walk of faith. This is us running our race. This is us bearing our cross. This is us dying to self. This is us, you know, and being in the trenches and and trying to to strive at this in a way that, you know, we we honor God as best we can. And so I'm less concerned about ever making a statement if someone is saved or not. I don't care. I think that each one of you on this right now, I think we're all hashing out our faith to the measure of fight within us, to the measure of circumstance, to the measure of, you know, what God has already deposited in us, right? Matthew was at 830, right? Who he called, he justified, glorified, um, you know, called, predestined, justified, glorified. I always get that order wrong. But I hope that it's like a long, long answer to your question. Um, I will absolutely judge. We're going to judge angels. I don't condemn so I'll never actually look on someone and say, like, you're not saved. Will I look at their fruit and have my own hesitations? Probably. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll look at my own fruit and be like, all right, are you just uh, you dropping the ball? You falling behind? You you missing the mark? Like, where exactly are you right now? And for me, you know, I'm actually I'm fortunate because I'm usually in a perpetual state of engagement. My son and I even had a conversation that I don't step off the gas like it's pretty much full throttle and. And I'm a vessel, as we all are, of God's love. We, Some of us are also an equal measure, if not greater, of God's, like we can carry the weight of God's anger and wrath and his anguish and his pain and his, his, you know, almost like heartache that more people are completely disregarding his son. But, you know, God's arm is not too short to save. And, dude, we, we're, we're, we're all here for a reason. I just... When I talk about my own faith and salvation, I just speak to a church that doesn't help identify people and where their faith and salvation is and should be. And I, I feel like it's just it's a it's a it's a call to where we need to become the church and we need to make people awake and aware to the best we can. Kind of like like the young men, the youth pastor, right? It needs to be just hard as nails. And as long as we're doing that, I, I can't convict another man of of being saved or not. I just can't. Mm -hmm. that's really really just between you and god uh it's yeah. not necessarily it's not necessarily some somebody that can come on the outside and tell you you are or are not saved i agree so uh gosh that's so people are so confused just in that one spot uh so, so let me jump in and add a little, little clarity here because yeah. you know scripture plainly teaches that you know, God declares who he is. It's for us to believe, right? If you believe, then you're saved, right? It, it's that's basically God reaches out to us with a process called faith. We then respond to that faith with the human emotion of trust and belief. If we believe God, it's accounted to us righteousness and we are saved. That saving us then has to be technically the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's where the Spirit of Christ comes alongside of your spirit, which is eternal and indwells in you. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the evidence of one who is saved. The fact that you're even here in this group right now means you care about God and the things of God. Ergo, you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Ergo, you are saved. The fact that you care is the evidence. Otherwise, if you didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't care and yeah. you wouldn't be here, right? Yeah. So the confusion comes in with is every single Bible that you guys have in your possession is a translation from the original text, which is for the New Testament, Koine Greek, and for the Old Testament, it's Hebrew. And those English translations from the original text leave some... Uh, things to be desired from time to time. There's a lot of gap from original language to receptor language. And this is where the people who you're talking to 
are drawing wrong conclusions and arguing about things because they aren't studying the Bible with uh, original languages in, in the scope of their study, right? If they brought the original languages into their study time, a lot of these things that are confused about would easily get cleared up. Um, one of the other things the Bible plainly teaches is, is that the idea of judging somebody where they are in their salvation is reserved for God and God alone. Again, that would be something only an original language study would draw out the word crino, which is translated into the English word judge. One of the things that we're told to never do is to judge one another. And so unfortunately, when you read the English of that, everybody runs around, oh, don't ever judge anybody. Well, the Bible absolutely teaches you to judge by saying, mm -hmm. don't cast pearl before swine. Don't give what is holy to the dogs. That like assessment. Yeah, it's, that's the phonetic thing, right? It's a language thing, right? It, it requires you to make a judgment call, right? Yeah. But what the Bible does also say is to not judge our brother in the sense there's a preposition called kata and kata crino because you have multiple prepositions you can put in front of that word crino, diacrino, anacrino, and kata crino. Katakrino is the preposition which catapults somebody down, meaning you're condemning them to hell. We are told in the original language scriptures to never do that. Unfortunately, that gets lost in an English translation because those prepositions don't carry over in the translation. And so what's, only, what's the legal backing, Paul? Sorry to cut you off. The legal backing is the power of life and death is in your tongue. Yeah, so, and, and it's God and God alone that judges the heart. So we can never tell somebody you're going to hell. Yeah. We can say to them, if you stay on this course of disobedience to, to God and rebellion to God, this is going to end you in hell. But basically to declare somebody you're going to hell, that judgment is, we're told to never do it. It's reserved for God and God alone. And that makes sense because only God knows a man's heart, right? Yeah. Knows where he is with that person. So true. The only I mean, evidence of salvation you need is the fact that God is drawing you into a relationship and you're responding to that. That is the, all the evidence you need. You know, you know, if God is drawing you and you're responding and you're walking in the faith that he's given you with the human emotion of trust and belief, that is the entire sanctification process that we're going through that Steve started talking about at the original opening of that question. I'm going to throw so, a wrench. Sorry, go ahead. Well, so, so so both sides are are wrong in 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 that that regard then because you know on the on the other side it's you know the, the church that I was going to is I think it's like the second biggest church in in the country uh, and you know when you get big like that they care more about their following than they do <laughs> the word and yeah. they just want people to come and give them money uh, even though they still do good things but anyway uh, getting off on a tangent. What, what they what they always do towards the end of their sermons is uh, what is it Romans uh, Romans I forget which one but it's basically where if you confess with your mouth uh, that you know Jesus is Lord is, is your Lord and Savior you will be saved uh, and so they get everybody to you know bow their heads close their eyes raise their hand and and say that prayer or whatever and then they're saved well the group that I was a part of the small group was just like, no, that's not real savior, you know, like uh, real salvation. Um, and, and so they took it in a, in a different direction. And I, I could see both sides, uh, but I disagree with both sides too, because on, on one end, you know, you're just saying some words, like, do you really mean it? Because a lot of people, Conviction. Will go, yeah. yeah. A lot of people will go out there uh, they'll, they'll say they'll say those words and then they'll go out and just do the same thing that they've been doing through their entire life. Right. And then on the on the other end, uh, you have people that are saying, oh, well, this is not good enough. No, you're you're not saved because you keep doing this. And it's like, OK, well, you know, that, that's where my confusion came from. But that definitely clears it up. For me, the, so transformative, I the that. transformative work of the Holy Spirit is evident in those who have Christ indwelling in them. The whole sanctification process that we as Christians go through our entire lives is dying to self. That goes on forever until we go to our grave. Now, this idea of just, you know, um, that you can just declare that you believe in God, and that means you're getting to the kingdom of God, that is unbiblical. The scripture clearly teaches that your belief has to be followed up and followed through with obedience to Christ. I mean, and I, and I can prove that to you because in scripture, it, it teaches that the demons believe. And the demons believe that Jesus is who he says he is, but they don't follow him in obedience. They're not going to heaven just because they believe. 
right? It requires not only believing that God is who he has declared that he is through his written word, it then requires repentance. And repentance, if you go to the original language of the Greek, repentance means a changing of your mind, a transformative changing of your mind, meaning not only do you change your mind, but that mind change then shifts the direction in which you're yeah. going through life. You're no longer now for the world and its cares. You're now for God and his things, right? And and there's there's the duality. There's there's repentance, but also confession. And the confession of sin right. is so that you are healed. Right. And and that's one another. But I I and correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but it's like, is it more so the the assessment of someone's like spiritual position? Like some someone that says Oh, I'm a Christian just because they, you know, said the Lord's prayer, the sinner's prayer one time. You know, we consider kids like boys that say, "Oh, I'm a girl," right? We consider them delusional, mm -hmm. right? So it's by all like current standards, well, maybe not all current standards, but be because of that, right? You, you can't just take someone at faith value. It just it gets pretty murky when you start to like cast doubt on someone else's salvation. But I'm going to throw another wrench because I don't know the last time you read Luke 17, right? In the apostles said to the lord increase our faith and so he basically gives a parable and he says um it's worth reading so the, so the lord said if you have faith as a mustard seed you can say to this mulberry tree be pulled up by its roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you and which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field come at once and sit down and eat but will he not rather say to him prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk. And afterward, you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, right? Obedience. When you've done all the things you're commanded, you have to say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. So even in our salvation, right, the question first was increase our faith. If we're doing the least amount of obedience that we're just instructed to do, we cannot say that we have increased our faith. We can basically say, like, we are saved and we obey to the point that we are just in obedience. We have not gained faith. We are not growing in our faith. I think a lot of people, and you guys can probably, you know, probably have people in your lives are doing it. People think like, oh, I'm a Christian and I tell people I'm a Christian, therefore I'm increasing my faith, right? They're doing these little micro moves, mm -hmm. thinking they're moving God's heart or God's needle. I would argue that a lot of them probably aren't. But again, that's I reserve that to be between them and God, not, not between me and them. And to me, the parable of the mustard seed is self-explanatory. You know, they're, they're wanting their faith increased and, and basically they're being told that if you had faith the size of a mustard seed you could throw that mountain into the ocean right the whole point there that, that jesus is trying to make is they don't possess any faith at all it's, a, it's all from god it's god's gift to you 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 know and this is what a lot of people have a big disconnect with even though you know we all know the bible verse that says you know it's a gift from god at least any man boasts right well, if we truly believe that we we don't possess the faith and it's a gift from God, well, then it means it's all from God. It's a benevolent flow of grace and mercy from our creator to us. So how do we respond to that? If it's all coming from God to us, then the only thing that we can do is respond with the human emotion of trust and belief. Gratitude. And, step, and, the, and gratitude yeah. and step into it, right? And so uh, the idea of us possessing faith yeah, it's our faith once God gives it to us, but that's, that would be as, as uh, silly as saying, because I have this lamp in my hand, and I turn it on and the light comes on, that it's my light. Well, no, the source of that light is the power station in my neighborhood pumping coal to run a generator to produce power to come down the lines to turn the lamp on. Yeah, it's my lamp, I have it, it's my light, but am I the source of its power and its light? No, the power plant is. It's the same thing with faith. We the faith is a gift from God. We receive it and we, we enjoy it. And yes, we can call it ours, but the reality is it's all coming from God to us. Okay. And as long as we're responding to it and moving into it and leaning into it, that's what the whole sanctification process is about. And that's what every Christian is called to do. And so 
I know it's very tempting for a lot of Christians to look at our human behaviors and declare, oh, because you're engaged in that, 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 uh, you're not saved. But again, there are there are there are prepositions and there are tenses in the Greek that they don't understand. And until we look at those verses individually, I can pick them apart and show you why they come to those incorrect conclusions. But I would just say uh, we probably shouldn't do that. There are behaviors that scripture says, if you are engaged in these, you are not going to heaven. But we, that's a whole study to understand what are we talking about and what does that look like with boots on the ground, right? It's, yeah, like it's the, the, the longest answer of salvation ever. Sorry, yeah, it's not the, occasional oh, slip, not the occasional stumble, right? Mm-hmm. We all are slipping. We're all stumbling, right? But yeah. that's what forgiveness is about. Yeah, it's that's, the person that's... who stays in that place, rebellious against God. Those are the ones that aren't going to see the kingdom of God. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the the what I was going to what I was going to say is like we're, we can't be perfect. We're not. We're not. We'll, we'll we'll never be perfect. So, you know, I I guess it's all a matter of improvement. You know, are you improving? Are you trying right. to get better? You know, because right. uh, you know, the Bible also says God you know, knows your heart. And so, uh, like like I said before, I mean, I guess you know from from what we're seeing here, it's it's really kind of just between you and God. Uh, whether you were you know, saved or not. Yeah, I, I, did a, I did a study that helps men to kind of piece this together called the, the, the tri-fold nature or the triune nature of mankind. Just as God is triune in nature, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, just as the temple had three sections, the inner most holy of holies, the inner court and the outer court, we too are triune in nature. God created us with a spirit that's eternal, a soul, and a flesh. And to understand how can we still do wicked things like Paul complained about and still be eternal and with God, you have to understand the three parts of who you are, flesh, soul, and spirit. And when you understand that the flesh in it dwells no good thing, as Paul says, and because it dwells no good thing, it gets left behind. It, it stays here on the earth and, and rots in the ground. But I have your soul a, and your spirit are eternal. That's what goes on to be with the Lord. I have so a weird start, analogy. What's that? I have a weird analogy that Matt. Okay, well, when you start to understand that <laughs> dynamic, you can understand the war that is going on. Paul says in yeah. Thessalonians, "My spirit's at war with my flesh; the flesh is at war with my spirit." Yeah. And, they, and they're they're never going to agree with one another, and they're like fighting over what? They're fighting over the man's soul. What, what, what yeah. direction can we turn? Right. And as long as you understand that, and you understand that that's the way it's designed, then it should not baffle us that we look at porn. Or that we drink too much, or that we kick our dog when we come home. Those Unless it's midget are, porn, by the way. Midget porn right. is weird. That's that's. I'm gonna <laughs> assess you all day. Yeah, those moments that we relapse, that all belongs to the flesh. But God has been very clear. That flesh is covered. It's dead. It, 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 you're carrying. It's weakened at Bernie's now. You're carrying that dead flesh around. It doesn't matter anymore, right? It, it, so it, here's here's my analogy, and I I think it'll help because again. All of us have a different measure of self-assessment, right? So Matt, right, as, as much as you coach people, right, when they get to the gym, right, you know that they will self-assess themselves to a certain point within the knowledge that they have, the experience, right? And it's, it's a holistic view that's oftentimes short-sighted if, you know, you're comparing yourself to a professional or to someone else that's above you, right? You are the coach. This is our coach. Mm-hmm. Right. So all of a sudden what happens is you have a bunch of Christians that say I'm saved, you know, by grace alone. They don't apply themselves in, in faith and works. They reject any sharpening, which, you know, they take it like condemnation, but they also refuse to dive into the word and they they check the box on Sundays. Mm-hmm. So that self-assessment is very, very lenient and they're not self-driven. They're not, you know, the, the goal setting is it's a little short sighted. If they esteem themselves as something, ultimately God will correct them. And we pray for those people mm-hmm. because the Holy Spirit convicts. And when if we choose to spend time around them, we hope that we're brushing up against them for their betterment and for our betterment, too. Yeah. So it's like the 30 minute answer for salvation. Does that work? Yeah, yeah no, not, that definitely helps. I mean, uh yeah, that, that was too. So you, you can't sweat it because there's plenty of examples where Jesus yelled at the disciples for not yeah. having faith, right? Yeah. So, and they watched him perform miracles and they still doubted him. So. James, can you imagine yeah. being James, right? Your little brother is like doing all this crazy stuff and you don't even believe he's legit until he dies and 
shows up again later. Just saying. James well, is a little you, salty. You asked Steve earlier in the gathering here, where are all the men in the church? And that's a loaded question. Um, Everything with me quite, is, usually. Yeah, that, <laughs> that question, if we start to unpack it, the Lord kind of revealed something to me this week, kind of showed me something has gotten me going down. You know, I'm kind of getting red-pilled by God right now, and I'm going down a rabbit hole that I don't like. <laughs> um, and I and I'm and I'm gonna throw it out there, and I, I want you to know this is still very raw. And even my wife warned me, don't bring it up because you need to do a lot more homework. Now you have to. Yeah. yeah see, right. And um, so I'm watching. Rum I, I jump into Rumble the other night, and I suddenly you know, I get ready to go to one of my channels to get some media input, and I'm seeing this one channel push to the front of the line with 25,000 people watching it live. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's a lot of people. So I jump in, I catch what apparently is the last 15 minutes of like a three hour long thing. Uh, it's a channel called Fresh and Fit, and it was episode 130. Yep. Uh, delusional witch fights panel, and this happened, right? I was just in shock, drawn in how these young people were talking to each other yeah. and treating one another. And I was like, this guy has unassailable logic as a as a man in the world his logic is unassailable and he's literally just mowing these girls down one guy mowing down nine women with just unassailable logic and it alarmed me because i didn't realize that young people were treating each other this way so i actually looped my son who's 24 years old i said have you ever heard of these guys he's all no so i started explaining what this guy was doing and his unassailable logic and my son's all, oh, he's just an Andrew Tate wannabe. I'm all, Andrew Tate, who's that, right? Oh, God. And so I didn't know. So we, you know, so now my son's all, that's a rabbit hole, Dad. You don't even want to go yeah. down. And so, of course, my wife, when oh. she got, like, she started watching all this stuff, watching all these podcasts with Candace Owens and everybody else, uh, you know. Um, and so we're starting to realize that the thing that I feared was this idea that he's planting out there is unassailable logic in a world devoid of Christ. It is purely a Darwinian um, survival of the fittest, natural selection, Pavlovian dog response of how a male in his natural sin state would behave. Right. Well, well, <laughs> it, it it is because uh, because I've I've listened to uh, quite a few of of Andrew Tate's you know videos, his speeches, and whatnot. There, there, he does speak a lot of truth, but there are definitely some, you know, misconceptions and some confusion that he has, especially when it comes to uh, God and, and, and religion. But, uh, but no, like that's what men are gravitating to nowadays because they're so frustrated with everything. And right, uh, and that's, that's the Tate's poison. still in a void, isn't he? Yeah, well, that's the he poison. is still in a void, yeah. Yeah, that's the poison. This is the same thing that went on in Nazi Germany, where Hitler appealed to the nationalism of the German people. He he basically found a people who were basically, you know, wiped out after World War One and so depressed that he appealed to a, a nationalism that caused Nazi Germany to rise to power. Uh, and so what you have is men being basically castrated for the last 60 years by the feminist movement. And media all around. Any male that stands up gets castrated and told to to go in the corner and cry. And so he now has an entire audience of men who want to be men again, and he's their voice. Unfortunately, his entire viewpoint is devoid of God and God's creation and God's order in that creation, which exactly. makes him dangerous because he's about to throw women 2,000 years into the past. Yeah. And to where they're back to being chattel in a relationship, you know, where men treated their animals better than their women, right? Well, he he acts, he he doesn't he does act. How, how, yeah, yeah he, he says one thing, but he does, yeah, he does another. Like uh, he tries to say the right thing, but he doesn't do the right thing. Right. Like, uh, but he's infecting young men, is my point, right? Yeah. And this well, is dangerous. I think us Christian men, we need to have a counter to this before this gets this I, these ideas that he's spreading start taking hold there has to be a a concerted christian counter attack to these ungodly ideas because christianity literally uh elevated women to a place of 
um, order with men that was all equal in God's eyes. I mean, when Jesus came on the scene, he literally, he was delivering women out of the bondage that they were in, right? Which is what the world had put them in. It seems like this guy's rhetoric is about to get a huge following or has a huge following where men are willing to, with this sheer human logic, devoid of Christ, is going to put women right back into that dark age, right? Well, uh, I, I mean, I mean, partly, partly, and uh, you know, I've I've listened to some of the things that the guys on Fresh and Fit have have talked about, and I, I get what they're saying, and they they want things to go back to a more of like a, a traditional uh, approach, but the that but that's the that's the problem is they say they want this old traditional approach but they don't want to become traditional themselves they don't want to they don't want to get married they don't want to have a family they're 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 scared of marriage they literally are they talk about they preach to, to young guys don't get married because they'll the woman will take your ass to court and take half of your uh uh worth uh and and uh they'll just they talk about you know and that has to do with the state being involved in marriage and whatnot but uh, but also like rejection. It, just, it scares, yeah, and it it's, it scares men and, and being uh, vulnerable. Yeah, and from from being vulnerable and being comfortable with themselves to get to that point because these guys, like they don't they don't care. <laughs> they're they're there for the, the the money and everything that they're getting, yeah, the notoriety that they're gaining the from their show. Yeah, yeah. Can clicks. I can I be honest though, Paul? And I mean, I haven't watched it, I haven't seen it, but yeah. but as Christians, right? This is where. We just kind of like I gotta watch with either a little glass of scotch or some popcorn. Like, look at the look at this shit show. It's a dumpster fire, and it's because we know this is going to happen, and it's actually gonna get worse. This is part of lawlessness. If you right. think about like there, there is no law regarding family and regarding relationships. There's no, there's nothing that governs or influences, you know, from a higher perspective that keeps you in check, keeps both parties in check because of their love and fear of God. And their honor to God and the honor to the commitment. And because of that, we're just what we're watching is more godlessness on display. I don't think there's going to be a Christian alternative that's going to sway hearts at scale. I don't know. It's not because it's uncomfortable. And, 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 and so, people people don't want to be uncomfortable. They just want to be comfortable. And uh that's what their flesh wants. And yep. so they they follow that. It's the it's the path of least resistance. So uh I mean for me, for 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 my situation, like I had to hit rock bottom and really take a look at myself and I was forced to self-reflect. And I think a lot of men just, they avoid that. Like they do just enough to where they're, they're just comfortable enough to where they're just miserable instead of just, I let it all go. Yep. I crashed and it made me realize like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing and I need to you know, get my act together. And, you know, that I think it was God's way of saying, Hey, Matt, wake up. And he sent me a reality check. And that's kind of what brought me back to God and, 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 and Jesus and, and the word and whatnot. But, uh, you no, know, as far as like, um, just the, the cultural standpoint and the show and Andrew, Andrew Tate and whatnot, uh, I, I think it's not necessarily a step in, the total wrong direction, because there are some good things that they do say. I'll I'll give credit where credit is due. Right. Yeah. No question. But, yeah. But but those those other things that 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 you're that you're mentioning as well. That's it's it's bad. So it's yeah. like you got a little bit of good and with the bad, and a lot of people will put them all in in the the same basket as good. And that's well, the problem. It, it, when you take God out of the picture and Christ's order. And it, you strictly go with the Darwinian natural selection choice, right? Um, okay, so God created men and women to be equal in the kingdom of God. But here on earth, he gave men more testosterone, more strength. But, but because of that doesn't mean we go beat up women and club them like baby seals and, and, and destroy them off the planet because they're annoying, right? Um, you know, when I asked my wife, you know, why does the Bible teach you that you will be saved through child bearing right so, and i asked her save from what she hadn't really thought about it i'm all we'll save from utter total destruction is what the answer is because if if men go down the natural thinking of they would totally dominate and and probably wipe you off the face of the planet 
albeit the fact that you're one of the ones reproducing the population. Now, that same logic that Andrew Tate seems to have that because I am, I'm just going to do, that would be like saying, well, because I'm a male and God gave me uh, the desire of a woman in my, you know, in my eyes or heart that I, I, would, I get to have sex with everybody who I find attractive. No, and that's this logic that I think is kind of running away. And that's why when I hear what little I've hear, I've heard, the logic is unassailable from a humanistic point of view. And that's why it's going to resonate with so many men. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. God has said otherwise. God has already chimed in on this. And that's why I think, you know, as men, we have to start to defend women and women need to come up with a counter to this argument too. Otherwise they are going to get pushed back 2000 years back into the stone age of how men view them and treat them. And then that's not how God wants it. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't I actually don't even think uh, it should no. happen. I, cause, cause what you're, what you're watching is the worldly natural response to godlessness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and well, if, I think I, 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 I have, I'm a little more optimistic about it. <laughs> good. Good. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think things are, are definitely polarized. Uh, but if things start to swing, if things start to swing in the wrong direction, then I think a lot of people are just going to fall. Like they're just going to follow the crowd, that type of thing. Um, but uh, there are a lot of people who are looking for answers and they're looking for truth and they're looking for, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's do definitely, you, it's a mess. Do you think that the guys that are going to be swayed by the Andrew Tates of the world, do you think that those are the ones that will, are really ever going to do anything in the name of Christianity that's going to be great anyways? I mean, you're just kind of talking about how the Christianity won't won't scale like 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 many things in the media will these days, right? It's a, it has small grassroots effects. I think Tate is the type of dude who he's going to affect the guys that want, for lack of a better word, microwave ma masculinity. They want it quick, fast, and easy. They don't want it real. They don't want it vulnerable. They don't want it that comes with courage. They want it to look like it's masculinity and not be true masculinity. I don't and think they're ever going to be the other type anyway. You brought up a great point, which is the one thing that really is about is this attitude among men or people that they're willing to do anything and everything but God. Right? They're willing to explore anything. I can't they're willing to run down anything. They're willing to look at anything as long as it's not God. And I think you're exactly right. That that's They just want to consume. They don't want to do anything with it. The, they don't want to act. Yeah. I'm gonna yeah. throw some. I'm gonna throw something at you guys. Sorry, Matt. Go keep going. Well, I was gonna say it's it's a it's crabs in a bucket, man. They they just want to hear what makes them feel better, and they're miserable. So they they want to hear everyone else who is miserable uh, talk about the things that just make them feel better. And so when they see Andrew Tate, they see the cars, they see the money, they see the women, they see the mansions, they see the boats, they see the traveling, they see all of this, and they're like, oh, he's got it. You know, he's this man has the answers. And and so it's just it's an easy trap to fall into. I have a feeling God is going to use a lot of unconventional people that we probably would would write off. Elon, I think he's going to use Elon Musk. It's, I mean, I, I actually I found myself praying for him. I mean, yeah. yeah, I'm even laughing because like you know, imagine the testimony of a guy that throws a Halloween party and and dresses right and that Vlad the Impaler, you know, armor. I was laughing. I'm like, all right, the Pentagon. Okay, cute. I like yeah. it. It's cute. And it's it's funny though because what do we already know? We already know that people that don't fear God, have no reverence for him, are going to chase their tails, right? They're chasing circles. They're, they're running in circles, playing whack-a-mole with everything from new age, porn, lust, like whatever the desires of the heart are. They're still entering marriage. They're, they're trying to figure out their sexuality. I, there's such an increase in uh, I, 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 the, there's porn statistics that came out about the amount of porn that is regarding um, uh, fantasies or basically having like husbands watch their wives have sex with other men, vice oh, versa. Cool. Yeah, that uh, bestiality, uh, f f uh, all this this incest between like step siblings and like parent child. So you see like the increase of this. The world is increasing its own appetite. And it's just being consumed by their own want. And the Lord already says, again, he knows those that are his, which means there are those that aren't, which means like, you know, according to Romans, right, God will give people over to a debased mind. And if, if the, the farther you go into Romans 1, what are you looking at? 
God's not going to force you to have a root canal. God's not going to force you, even if he's given you an idea of faith and something's planted there, he's going to call on those that are his that still want something to do with him. And God, God doesn't force anyone into a relationship, which means we are absolutely going to have a bunch of people who are going to have nothing to do with him, who are going to gravitate towards this stuff and be in the throes of all these things. There's going to be, you know, there has to be a herd of people that take the mark and follow the beast and worship the Antichrist. There's more of them than there are faith-filled, spirit-filled Christians. We already know that we're the underdog in the story. Mm-hmm. We're going to continue to be willed down until then. And so that's what I just have to encourage all you guys and, and whoever ends up watching this. <clears throat> if you're running your race without any hesitation, trepidation, conviction, if nothing is getting in your way, <clears throat> God's going to use you in whatever room that you're in. Doesn't doesn't matter how big, how small. Could be an arena, could be just an apartment c- complex. And you could be the one that brings people that he wants across the finish line. You're the man he sends. But it doesn't happen if you refuse to grow your faith and acknowledge that you have to have a faith position, that it's actually cowardly to go through life without somehow addressing your spirituality before you die, especially if you're a father. Imagine, I can't tell you how many dads are like, oh, I'm just going to let my kid figure it out. I'm just, you know, I'm not going to force them to think a certain way. It's like, okay, so the world is trying to tell your kids that they need puberty blockers and they should have their, you know, their genitals cut off. Sorry. Sorry you should probably play a bigger role in that than you think. But then you read the Bible. What does the Bible say? The Lord raises people's children for the sword. The Lord will send men as a ransom for you. A thousand will fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand. So as as the book continues to be read out loud, as the compression happens, listen, uh, the whole, you know, the stage is set for everything that the, you know, powers that be want to, you know, get us towards. There's going to be a compression, and in, within that compression, as the devil squeezes tighter and tighter, God's people are going to squeeze out through in between the fingers, and spiritual exploits will abound. Like we care about the people and their salvation and the cultural condition around us until we basically will have to care about something else. But that's why we have to be balanced. You have to pray this out. You have to pray for faith, forgiveness, and salvation for those that God's putting on your heart and in your circle. Outside of that, it's on to the next. Like, I believe casualties are coming at scale. I, I, we've barely even cracked the code on that. Mm-hmm. And because of that, does God want you tripped up, lamenting and mournful and sorrowful over those that died? No, let the dead bury the dead. And so as long as we stay in that constant movement, right, a constant tempo, that's where God needs us. It's, got, it's where God's calling us. And I believe that God's allowing us to see the recompense of the wicked because he's like, hey, um, I need you to pay attention because we've actually got some work to do. Mm-hmm. So resolve this now, resolve your heart now. And as things unfold and, and escalate, you know, God's got his people ready to to take action in a way that a lot of other people won't. Well, yeah. a, another, another aspect of it, uh, per, perspective of it is like, I think there's a lot more of us than we believe. I, I think that it's, it's just a, a, a condition of, you know how like the, the, the squeaky wheel gets the oil or whatever the the, the saying is, like uh, the the small minority that is loud gets a lot of the attention. But I think there's a lot of people that look up, look on these things and they're just like, this is wrong. This is you know, it's it could be fifty fifty. I don't know, but I think there's a lot more of us and and people that are looking for answers and and trying to go trying to to go down the right path. Uh, then we then we believe. But I, I think we got to hear what Steve is saying, though. And, and what I think you're saying, Steve, is if we really are entering the last days, then all these things that I'm concerned about and the counterattacks that I'd like to propose to push back on them, none of that's going to matter. If we're entering the last days, these things are just going to get worse and worse because God's already already declared that. And so, but even even to what both you were saying, it's cool because as God continues to work through us. What's going to happen? All of a sudden, we're going to be doing some supernatural exploits, the book of Acts on steroids, and those people. And so, Matt, it, I always I always kind of say this. <clears throat> I feel like there's two types of Christians in this country right now. It's the spirit-filled American Christian, and it's the patriotic American. 
that doesn't actually that hasn't connected all the dots or followed the breadcrumb trail all the way back to Christ and are, are driving at their faith. But I feel that the patriotic American has the Old Testament heart of God that wants justice, wants family, wants tradition, wants morality, wants the social condition to be like it was that they were born into. The word of God tells us that, you know, tomorrow is not promised and God has the right to reserve the sin onto the third and fourth generation. And the patriotic American doesn't know, according to, you know, Nehemiah 1 and Deuteronomy and, and Numbers, you have to repent on behalf of your fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers, as well <laughs> as Job, repent for your children. Like the, the patriotic American doesn't know that there's enough spiritual work to keep you busy and to not idolize a political figure like they're going to somehow save things. But yes. that said, if you take the patriotic American and the Pentecostal or spirit filled American and you brought those two sides together and you could help each other see their value in one another and they both come forward under the, the banner of Christ, Jehovah Nisi, that's an unstoppable army. That's an army that has the potential of being worthy of a king's return. Because it starts to be kinetic, right? All of a sudden, they, they're gleaning something from us, and the church gets something from them. And all of a sudden, you've got both sides of God's heart united on the on the war path. And God's like, okay, cool. I can probably do something with this. This is going to get exciting. Yeah, because, I mean, to, I guess, uh, to that point, I mean, you have you have people who are, you know, they're going down the right wrong path. They are, you know, participating in hookup culture and whatnot. But then eventually uh, most, I think most people who get into hookup culture, because this is what happened to me. Like I, I eventually thought to myself, like, I, I don't enjoy this. Like I want companionship. I want something, I want it to be more meaningful than this. And I think a lot of people feel that way. And so they, they start to try to gravitate towards doing the right thing. It's just, they got to have somebody that introduces them, introduces them to the word and, and whatnot. And a, another wrench that gets thrown into the to the spokes there is that you have a lot of people that we like we were talking about earlier they don't know how to approach people they they come with this uh self-righteous attitude uh and smug attitude trying and it just turns people away and and so uh i don't know there's a lot there's there's a lot that <laughs> goes into it but let me ask you a question though if you're so focused on running your race and being exactly how God made you and being constantly refined by his fire where he is melting off the dross. He's changing your ways. He's, he's increasing your conviction. He's showing you right the way that he wants you to be is your time and effort better spent on being unapologetically the fullest measure of how God created you or worrying about the people who might be offended. That's a trick question, by the way. It's a total trick question. Yeah, that's but, why I was that's why I was thinking about it because it's like there there are some times where I will, uh, dude. Like, your fence to someone actually might stir them and be that little marker, that little seed that God then waters all along the way. Like that, praise God for offense. Think about how many people in your life. Think about your own life. Something has challenged you. If it wasn't the Word of God, it was other humans, and all of a sudden you started doing something different. I think it's powerful. It can, can it be abused? Yeah. What does what does Paul say? Uh, something about he says something about being all things to all people. I don't know. I don't know the scripture that well. You know, like when he's in Greece, he's a Greek. When he's for the sake like, of winning them over to Christ, right? That's right. what I'm talking about. He yeah, becomes yeah. what they are for the sake of winning them over to Christ, but not giving up his his identity with Christ, right? Totally agree. So he, that, yeah. He's just not going to bring his religiosity into their sphere. If they yeah. eat meat and wherever he came from, they don't eat meat. Well, he won't eat meat in order to win them over to Christ, right? Yeah. yeah. Just I was just thinking that kind of speaks to the posture, yeah, of like how you approach people because this conversation, I think, uh, Matt was bringing up, right? It's like some of these people are coming in with like kind of an attitude of like, you know, self-righteousness sort of thing. Yeah, so. and, and if you're worried about how you're coming across, you can look to the Bible to get answers here because if you go to Matthew chapter 23, you're going to see a side of Jesus where he is literally clubbing the Pharisees and Sadducees like they are baby seals. And it's pretty brutal. And so you also have to understand that every time Jesus opened his mouth, he pissed off half the crowd. Half the crowd wanted to pick up rocks and kill him, mm -hmm. and the other half wanted to follow him, right? So... Uh, I, I'm not sure a gauge of how people are responding is 
the right uh, position to take. That shouldn't mm -hmm. be, that should not be the gauge. The gauge should be, am I accurately representing the kingdom of God? Am I accurately representing God's truth? And if you are, already know it's going to be divisive because the Bible declares so, right? And if you're not pissing people off, then you're a Candyland Christian man, right? Well, because, the, <laughs> you know, the truth you should be pissing people off when you open your mouth, especially the truth, if you're telling the truth of Christ. The, the truth pisses people off. And, you know, exactly. Jesus said, I am the truth, the, the, yeah. li the way of the life. And so yeah. to me, like, I, I took that literally. Like, he literally is the truth. Because you got to think, the truth is like a light. It's a light that shines in the darkness. And uh, it, it opens people's eyes. Unless, of course, they try to try to reject it. But, uh, but no, speak. I, I, I try to speak truth. And I, I, I do have, like, this conviction about me that I just, like, it pisses me off that people are living a lie. Like, that, that just, there's something inside of me that is just, like, I hate that. Like I want, I want to shove the truth in your face, like, because uh, I know how I used to be, and I used to get pissed off at the truth too, uh, and I also used to be, uh, uh, I guess, uh, how can I say it, for a lack of a better word, a little bit. I don't know where that came from. Who's, who's that got? Charlie? I don't know. Let me try and mute something. Can I, can I mute people? So it's got some festive background going on. There you go. You got him. All right, there we go. Yeah. Nice. Guys, it's, prob it's probably me. I'm uh, doing cardio here at the gym. I, I first want to say I appreciate you guys letting me jump in uh, on this uh, on this Bible study. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. There's just a few things I wanted to say uh, as we talked here that I think make a lot of sense. And I, and I think, you know, we were talking about the Andrew Tate's in the world. Um, you know, having a big impact. And I think what you're going to see is God's spirit move on this country in a big way. And, and I think we're going to see a harsh time come about to where it's going to press people into looking for more and more and more. And I, and I think when that happens, I think us as, as warriors of God need to stand up and, and, and point people in the right direction. Everything, you know, a lot of what you guys have said, I and mean, I, I can't agree more with with the direction we're going in and uh, just kind of the stance of everybody. But again, I just, I want to thank everybody for, for having me on here today with you guys. And I look forward to uh, continuing. So, Glad to have you, man. Not a problem. Not a problem. Glad you're getting that cardio, by the way. You're better man yeah. than I am today. <laughs> Lord knows I need it. Lord knows I need it. <laughs> no, Matt, Matt, you know, what's, you know, what's cool though, Matt, is that your, that's a self-assessment, right? Your self-assessment is like you, you you want to be pressing in, you want to convey the truth, you want to operate with conviction, and you want to win souls. It's exactly where God needs you to be. Because yeah. the, other, the other arm is, as long as you're operating with the Holy Spirit and you're listening and heeding that still small voice inside you, he's going to tell you what to say, how to say, and when to say it. A outside of that, you're good. Yeah, be, be like Steve and I. We wear it as a badge of honor when we're pissing people off. Because if you're speaking oh, yeah. the truth to Christ, you're going to make somebody mad. And if somebody gets mad, then wear it as a badge of honor. Because somebody else is going to hear that and be drawn to it. And they're going to want to know more. And they're going to want to connect with their creator. Can, the person can I, so, that doesn't is just going to get mad at you. So so just quick quick story before I, before I have to head out here. Um, back in 2018, I accepted a job with honda manufacturing as a process engineer and it was like a huge step up for me it's like it was my second job ever and i got a like a double pay increase and whatnot went there you know, uh eventually just became totally miserable working there like yeah the money was great but i was driving an hour back and forth to, to and from work having to work some saturdays working a ton of overtime it was just awful and uh this was when i was building my, my twitter following well i was at the at the time just like just wanting to say things like to be controversial like uh to to a certain extent and just wanting to put out the truth so i around the turn of the year hell is is about a, exactly a year ago that i that i or no i'm sorry uh four years ago that i did this so 2019 it was like a uh, january 6th of all of all days um I sent out this tweet that basically was talking about promiscuity and how, you know, women aren't feminine if they're promiscuous with every man that they, they sleep with, they're less feminine. And uh, I put that out there and eventually 
some feminists saw it and it blew up. It blew up. It went viral, and I was getting attacked by uh, you. You would be amazed at some of the things that people said to me. And at first, I was enjoying it. I was like, "Yes, I've got you know a ton of controversy. Like I pissed people off. That's exactly what I wanted to do." But uh, it was, and I'll never forget it. I, it was about two days afterwards, uh, the night of the national championship game, because Alabama was playing Clemson. I was sitting on the couch looking at my phone and all the comments that I'm still getting. And then I went over to check in, check my LinkedIn profile, which I never do. I never look at my LinkedIn for profile, but uh, it's got my setup of like where I worked and all this, all this stuff. And I noticed that I had like an, a, a ridiculous amount of views on my profile. And I was like, it, it all of a sudden it hit me. I'm like, oh crap, these people are probably calling my work. They're probably like trying to get me fired. And I'll get all these like thoughts start running through my head and this, this fear of, you know, what happens if I, if I lose my job and, and all this. Cause it was like, I wasn't ready to leave at this point. I mean, I was looking for different jobs and whatnot, but I uh, got paranoid a little bit and it started to make me think about things. And I uh, called, a, you know, I, I, going into work, I was sitting there thinking to myself, like, it's only a matter of time until someone calls me into an office to have a conversation with me about this. Uh, it never happened, but on the way home one day, I called a good friend of mine who, uh, you know, he's, he's a Christian as well. And he told me, he was like, Matt, I don't know why you're panicking. This is one of the best things that's ever happened to you. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? He was like, the reason why uh, you're scared right now is because you are outside of your comfort zone. This is stressful for you, but I'm telling you, this is, he was like, this is a moment of growth for you. This is really good for you. And he said, if they fire you, We'll hire a PR firm and we'll make something out of this. And I was like, uh, okay. I was like, I'm not on the same page as you, but at least you got me thinking a little bit. So I, I started thinking that night and I, I, I got to thinking, I was like, you know what? What if I did lose my job? What if I got fired? And uh, I realized that, you know what? That might actually be the best thing that ever happens to me because also at the time I was trying to build my coaching business. And having to work so much and drive so much, I didn't have time to, to, to work on my business. So I was like, if I lost my job, it would give me time to, to get this thing going. So uh, I was like, you know what? I, I just need to quit. I was like, regardless if I get fired, I just need to leave anyway, even if I don't get fi fired. So I uh, put in my two weeks notice and started to work on my business. And here I am today. Like, But it was... It was uh, a huge leap of faith for me to leave that job because I, I was. He he pointed it out to me. My buddy pointed it out to me. He was like, the only reason why you're staying at that job is because you're comfortable. You're getting a, a $1,200 paycheck every month or every week or whatever it was. And uh, that's, you know, you're, you're, that's your comfort right there. You're, that, that paycheck has got you chained to this job. And I was like, oh, crap, you're so right. I was like, and that that it took that, that self-reflection and being honest with myself to be like, I, I need to leave. I was like, I have to, like the answer was just so clear to me. So, uh, Amen. yeah. So, so it's like, and, and, uh, that was about the time that I was, you know, starting to get, you know, stronger in my faith and whatnot, uh, because of the, you know, how I turned my life around and how I got this job and everything like that. So it was just, it was a huge ordeal for me, but um, uh, there's a lot of people who won't do that. They won't take that leap of faith. They won't step outside of their comfort zone. And it, it bothers me. I'm like, man, I, if all, if only people just knew if they, if they only just realize yeah, because yeah, there have been some stressful moments. There have been some times where I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills. I don't know how I'm going to pay rent this month. And I would, I would pray like, God, please like send me somebody. And I swear to you every time he did, he did something would happen. I, it would be like six days away from having to pay rent. And somebody would come out of nowhere and say, coach me, Matt, here's a check, you know? And I would, I would be like, Oh my God, like I just paid rent, you know? And so uh, it, it's been a roller coaster ride, but like, I want people to feel that. I want people to know like, He's got your back, you know. You don't have to be fearful. You don't have to be stressed out. Amen. Uh, no, dude. You know what? This is modern day martyrdom. When you're willing to to sacrifice and martyr your reputation for Christ, it's it's exactly what He's looking for, and it's that in in 
within that uncomfortable position, that discomfort, right? You're like a grape that's being crushed and turned into wine. Like God's getting out of you everything he put inside you to become. So praise God. It's huge. Yeah, and, and we don't have to, you know, seek discomfort. It'll come to us well enough. Um, the Bible clearly teaches us as best we can to get along with all men. But speaking the truth of Christ is going to, you know, basically unleash the fury every single time. So um, you, you can you, you can just press into that because this idea of pressing into that is going to get you in a place of discomfort because uh, you're going to then stir up, you know, uh, Moldor over there and they're going to all start coming after you. But this is going to give God an opportunity now to meet you because you've stepped into your face that he's given you. And because you step into that face, you put yourself on the line and you're and you kind of put your butt out there. And now you are overwhelmed because you just realize you've bit off more than you can true. And now God shows up in a mighty way and delivers you. And see, once you start doing that over and over again, you just start becoming like a you know, like an Elijah, right? Where nothing's gonna bother you now. You know God's gonna be there for you every single time. And now the world no longer has a, a grip on you because Really, you, you know, you can let it all go and walk into God's faith, and He's going to be there. Yeah, and and you just reminded me that the, the entire point of me telling that story was, uh, I, t I told the truth, spoke truth, and it it forced me, uh, or at least it led me into, you know, these circumstances. Uh, but I, I also one of the things that I thought to myself was. I don't want to stay somewhere where I'm censored. I have to censor myself. Like if I can't say the things that are on my mind for fear of losing my job, I don't, I don't want to have that job. Like I, I want to be working for myself so that I don't have to answer to anybody except for my clients. And God, of course, you know. Amen. Amen. I think that's um, another aspect of it is people are afraid of the consequences of, of speaking truth. And I think I've had a ton of people, I'm sure y'all have as well, where people will reach out to you and say, hey, thank you for saying these things because it's been on my mind. I just can't say it because I'll get fired and I have a family that I have to support. And I'm like, crap, you know, like I, I just hate that because I, t I totally understand. Uh, and you can't ask the, I, I, I can't ask those people uh, to, to speak truth anyway, because, uh, because I, I can't I can't make that decision for them to to put their family at, at risk, you know. So yeah, so it's you know here we are, send us, man. Just here we are to be sacrificed. It's pretty cool. No, dude, glad you could join. We, we do this every Thursday, so I know I know you boys are busy. All you guys are busy. So and, and these things, man. Sometimes they they're an hour. Sometimes they go with three hours. We just kind of like clear oh, wow. the slate and just. But it's cool, man, because we get to hash stuff out. Like we, I sent out a video, which I'll send you a link to it. I recorded off TikTok, and I, uh, it, it gives you a little sit rep of what's happening on the, on the border, and you know, part of the Ukraine con you know, conflict and what it, what's driving here soon. So, and, and we we talk about these things because it's not just about. It, like we'll get to the subject matter, but it's about like, listen, there's a bunch of stuff going on. Let's keep each other informed. Let's keep each other in prayer and um, let's just keep driving at faith. That's just it. We'll get there. Yeah. Amen. Well, I, yes. but I, I appreciate it, guys. Uh, uh, I hate to, to, to jump out, but I, I definitely I have to uh, oh, good, at, at this point. You're so, good, But yeah, hey, it was good talking to you all you guys. And I appreciate you inviting me, Steve. And I'll, I'll definitely be back next week. So Sweet, man. Um, yeah. Sweet. All right, guys. Y'all have a good night. See you, I don't know how many of you guys are on TikTok, but I can't tell you how many. You know, and it's scriptural. God says he'll pour out his spirit on all men, and people will dream dreams and visions. And I can't tell you how many videos I've seen of Christians jumping on that app, saying they're having dreams and visions of the U.S. being invaded. I, 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 it's countless. So it's just crazy, and, and I hear more and more. It's like God opens my eyes every week to something else that collaborates with a lot of these visions and dreams that I've seen. You know, we can say it's conspiracy theory and all that, but I, I really don't believe that. I think, like I was saying earlier, I think we're headed for some times that are really going to shake people. And, and I think through that shaking, you're going to see a lot of people that are lukewarm come alive in the spirit of God 
And uh, we're going to see, like we were talking about earlier, uh, miracles and things happen that uh, you know haven't happened for a very, very long time in, 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 you know, in, a, in mass. So just kind of crazy that I just heard that. Yeah, yeah. I'm a... Uh... I'm with you on all that, honestly, like kind of all this, like I, I hear that, you know, and I hear it from Steve too. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Yeah. This like lines up perfectly. Of course this is going to happen. I just want to know more. I want to know like, well, Steve, you're back. Like, where did that video come from? Like, that's what, like, I'm kind of curious, like, can I send I that guess. to somebody else? Should I not? And if I do send it to somebody who's skeptical, what am I going to tell them? So I've part of my request to the to my five guys is to um, actually confirm the name, the identity, um, and get some some background because I, I want to know exactly who this guy is and what I want to know what this man has to lose by by coming out and speaking up. It's really what I want to know. Kyle, I'm pretty sure the audio, the audio is on you. But you just joined and the distortion's back. So so are you guys part of military? Anybody part of military here? Nope. I mean, no civilian instructor, but that was twenty years ago. Okay. We do, we do we do have some people watching and listening though that that are uh, former and active duty, Mill and Ellie. Yeah, I served in the Marine Corps. That's probably ten years ago now, twelve years ago. But yeah, I served. Cool. So so I'm I'm sure your friends, if you got guys that are still in. I mean, you know what's coming across the border. That's That's been a pretty consistent thing. Um, so as of right now, yeah, it looks like it's a, it's a steady stream. And uh, I keep getting wind of the, the July to August um, time frame. And call it false flag, call it what you will. This thing can have the look and appearance of just some everyday looking people and just a lot of civil unrest. And again, whether it's climate change or something else, I don't know. They they have any number of narratives that they can, you know, do some sort of operation under. But the, here's the reality: we have people here within our nation that are completely unchecked. Don't know who they are, you know, don't know where they are, right? And they are all over the place. Um, my son was even commenting that there's a guy that works as a busboy in his restaurant <laughs> one day a week. Total military haircut, military age male build everything, and obviously like acting very suspicious. Uh, speaks rough Spanish with a Russian accent, and my son knows how to speak Spanish. And my, I, I, I sent the video. I showed my son the video. He's like, he's like, I got a bad feeling about someone at work, and he tells me, I'm like, oh, it's probably it's probably accurate. I mean, what better way, right? Just blend in, get to know the people, get to practice your your, your licks. And and we know this, right? This is going to go kinetic. We're watching too much, too much evidence behind it. There's, you know, there's too much money. It's changed hands, and a lot of that money could be used to to plant operatives. You got two hundred thousand troops in, I think it's Virginia, right? That that base, that naval base that's over there, that Obama gave to the UN, which is the UN reinforcement headquarters for Europe, and it's on U.S. soil. So. It's not to be afraid of it. It's just be aware, you know, be training, be vigilant. And and my call to you guys, you've heard me talk about it, but it's future prayer. Like I want you guys in a constant state and posture of declaring God's praise, his goodness, and with the mindset of something has happened or the full measure has happened and you're praying against it. I want you actively praying against it. This is this is part of the spiritual warfare component. It's first in prayer and then in person. It's realizing that we are going to have to absolutely use the tools of warfare, but we're going to engage this first in prayer and show God our heart and acknowledging that, listen, all warfare, the nations are a drop in the bucket to God. So as it relates to Jesus, Jesus is in control of nations rising and falling, of warfare beginning and ending. And if this is a constant escalation to lawlessness, which... All indicators are there. Our role is to make the enemy suffer for every inch of territory that he takes, which means first within our own lives. And then as we intercede for our circle around us, that means we might be called on to intercede physically for the community around us, especially, you know, I joked around about it, but rooftop Christians, right? We have rooftop Koreans during the LA riots. Imagine churches once again become a refuge for women, children, and elderly families. And it becomes a place where, you know, you're praying for the miraculous provision of food, 
praying for supernatural, you know, you're praying that that magazines don't run empty inside guns. You're praying that communications, you know, systems operate, that we have heavenly comms. And it's again, like take the natural sensation. Andrew, you'll appreciate this. Take the natural, you know, language, nomenclature and systems of warfare. And you're praying for heaven's version of that, whatever that is. And then you're praying to confuse the enemy. You're praying and you're actually getting a process where in your mind's eye, you can env envision someone's holding a rifle at your head and in the name of Jesus, that gun's not going to work. And they pull the trigger. It doesn't work. Like you need to see your faith all the way through to where you're praying for supernatural things to happen when you're outnumbered, outgunned and behind enemy lines. And right now, Christians are already born into a world behind enemy lines, right? We're already born into a place where we are under attack. Our faith is on the losing end because we are the minority that, you know, God has his people. He absolutely has a remnant and he's absolutely going to call us forward. But ours is to make the enemy suffer, to sabotage every single step and to basically become a people worthy of our King's return. I mean, I've, I've no, I've no ounce of me that lies to myself and says that we will become worthy or ever be worthy. He's the one that's worthy, but he's the one that's worthy of our effort. And if, if we can die to self, and accept the fact that God is calling us to supernatural exploits. At a moment of his choosing, he will turn it on, but we have to be in faith. We have to be operating in faith. A lot of this is available to us right now. There's a lot of things that have spiritually been withheld, especially from operating this country. But as soon as you step foot outside this country, you go to Africa, go to Mexico, South America, where there's black magic and, and other evil forces at work, all these things are readily engaged. And... I, again, we're too sheltered. So that said, I'm excited. I think it's I think it's confirmation for a lot of things. So I do have a question that kind of falls in line with this. Do, do you believe we are the new Babylon? Absolutely. So so if that's the case, I mean that scripture tells you know God tells us to come out of the new Babylon. Otherwise, we're going to share in her wrath. Or next, you know, God's wrath on, on Babylon. What's your thoughts there? I think that God's going to establish Goshen's biblical places of refuge within the country. I think that maybe coming out of Babylon is once a nation falls under distress and turmoil and, and you know, states secede and other, you know, nations are propped up or declared. I think God is, you know, as long as we're desiring it and operating in the spirit, God's going to keep those that he needs to keep or wants to keep alive. He's going to keep them supernaturally. I don't have the answers for that, but um, coming out of her means that we do not. And, and Paul, I, I know you've you've gone rounds around this, but we don't participate where the world is saying, look left, you know, do these things. God's saying like, no, like honor my word, be obedient in the face of society and culture, doing what Babylonian cultures do, which is exactly what the greater American, you know, systems are doing. Now, are you taking like get out of her? Uh, as almost like a, a call to leave the country? Yeah, that's kind of what I was referencing. Um, you know, whether we should stay here and, and, and let the pieces fall where they may. And if God chooses, you know, to use us in a big way and we, we, we lose our lives in that process, then so be it. You know, Jesus laid down his life. You know, who's to say we're not going to do the same? But, you know, I, I was kind of curious where you stood on that, whether whether you would recommend, you know, making making plans once once stuff hits the fan, so to speak. Um, God's God's worked in my life in a big way to open my eyes the last, I'd say, probably four or five years to some things that are coming. And uh, and, and I, you know, we, while you were away, we had a little conversation. And I'm big on TikTok, and I can't tell you how many people I hear on there with dreams and visions of Russia and China attacking the U.S. and uh, nuking certain, certain cities, and um, and I and I do believe some of those. Obviously, you need to test those in prayer, but uh, I do believe to a certain extent some of those are 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 right and from God. So, and I was kind of curious where you stood on all that. I I believe that if we're following the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to orchestrate and order our steps and move us strategically, physically, exactly where He wants us to be. Um, I, I joke around all the time about revival on the way down. I, I think that God's absolutely going to use us as calamity and falls as you know society goes into the throes of that. God's going to want his people to be engaged. And even last week I joked around, I, I got videos I still need to finish with it. Instead of calling it, you know, the tribulation or, or the end, call it the party, right? Like, don't you, you know, everyone's like, oh, we're not going to be here. We're going to, you know, it's like, you don't want to be here for the party? You want to miss it? What? 
it, like we need if we change the language and we change our perspective god's called us to the edge of eternity and if we look at it through the lens of like it's a party god is calling us to the biggest party on earth where we get to exercise everything that he put within us i i think that terrifies the enemy i think people that look forward to that i think the enemy is actually terrified that oh shit, he's got people that are unmoved and undeterred and unafraid entirely so i don't know i at some point do i see myself on a beach with a villa in, in israel somewhere in the mediterranean sea absolutely i love israel i actually like falafel just, just tell me steve when we get to the killings that's all <laughs> I, I i think god is gonna line up blue helmets we get to the us. God, god's gonna line us those line up those blue helmets much sooner than we'd like to think yeah. so you think uh you think babylon might be a specific place like uh hollywood you know they got the they got the arches uh i don't know this well, is kind of a wild idea it's the system yeah Ultimately, yeah I get that too. yeah but but i think certain towns can be judged god's gonna allow certain towns and cities and areas to be judged harsher than most absolutely so if, if you think about it right rome certain facets of rome and on in the height of it you know burning christians and 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 uh you know putting you know christ followers through incredible torment right it was in the throes of incredible sexual decadence and sexual anarchy that was happening right. and so while you know all that was going on god called his people to suffer and then all of a sudden you know works through Con um constantine there's a, there's a lot that we as a system you're gonna have to face and you know, rent's, rent's going to come due very soon. But I think you have a sense. I think Seattle is absolutely a target. So I'm glad you're well, in Idaho. You also got to know that Babylon is a real place. Yeah. You, you're aware that Babylon is a real place, right? You've heard of the you know, hanging gardens of Babylon. Yeah, yeah. And, right. and as of late, the last 10, 15 years, Babylon has had quite a resurgence of rebuilding and there's even vacation packages there's even websites you know called babylon holiday i mean it may be babylon that comes up again and again the judgment may lay directly at the place where it all started who knows but that's what i wanted to, yeah I was, I was curious on just the takes you guys had i know there's a bunch of them andrew i think we should start leading people on spiritual warfare tours to babylon let's just go do some <laughs> some reconnaissance absolutely i i uh, couldn't agree more couldn't agree more. I'm sure there's some shrimp cocktail there that needs to be slim. <laughs> but but like giant shrimp cocktail, like yeah. like Nephilim shrimp cocktail. <laughs> All right. We've gone we've gone through everything. Any any other thoughts before we dive in? I want to give you an invitation right now. If you do not know Jesus, it's time. It's time to come home. If you do know Jesus, it's time to reconcile. It's time to come home, whoever you are. You have an opportunity right now of seizing the moment and making the best of it, making the most of what life God has given you and entrusted you with. If not for yourself, then for others. This life is a call, is a work, is the commission towards others exactly as Jesus modeled for us. If you take that seriously, tomorrow's not promised. If you want to think about it, do that. You might be doing that at your own peril. You already know by now this ministry doesn't pull any punches. So when it comes to the work that we're supposed to do and the boldness we're supposed to have, my hope is that you watch us as an example and you learn to honor God in a very real and significant way. It's one thing where you just consume Christianity. It's another thing where you start to contribute it. And that's the opportunity presented to you right now. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever your past is, you have the opportunity of repenting and meaning it, of forgiving everyone in your past, even if you had to start with the words before your heart catches up. It's time. It's time. Not for them, but for you. And more importantly, for God. It's time. I pray for you. And if you want to accept my words, by all means do so. And then, over time, make them your own. Asking Jesus into your life is a one and done. However, if you truly mean this, your life will actually change. Jesus never left people the same once he walked with them and did life with them. And so if Jesus is truly on the inside of you and you mean everything that you say and you see it through and you read the words and you apply them, you're not going to be the same. You're not going to want to. Why? Because you're a new creation. It's as simple as that. It doesn't have to get complicated unless the enemy and you 
make it complicated. But in the name of Jesus, I pray right now for salvation, the spirit of grace and supplication to visit these people that are watching online. I pray that your mighty hand would move in their life, in their family's life. Father, I ask that you receive their heart posture and their words of repentance as they ask you for forgiveness, as they say, Father, in the name of Jesus, please forgive me. Search their heart and show them the people, the situations, the circumstances that they have to forgive and reconcile. Father, we know that forgiveness is often keeping us in bondage as much as it might be keeping other people in bondage as well. We are all the bad guy in someone's story. So Father, thank you for redemption, the work of the cross. Thank you for not leaving us as orphans. And thank you for sending us forward into a world equipped and under your authority in the name of Jesus. We owe you everything and we're here to reconcile and we're here to come correct and we're here to acknowledge you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we are bowing down to you as our Lord, our King, our Savior, our friend, as our commander. So Jesus, have your way with our life. Holy Spirit, guide us, speak to us, infill us. We desire the gifts of the Spirit. We desire to be Spirit-filled, Spirit-led Christians. Father, thank you for everything you've done. We can never, ever repay you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's it. Sort of. There's more. There's always more. But that's a good start. Whoever you are, I pray that you are blessed and edified. I pray that you are pressing in like never before. For God, for family, and indeed for country. Because we're going to need it. All hands on deck. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time. See ya.